All right, everybody. So welcome here. We've got uh, Hashoshi from the Hashoshi YouTube video and uh, our YouTube channel. And he is one of the uh, few people that I watch uh, almost on a daily basis, uh, along with a couple Thanks, other different YouTubers. So I brought him on because he is a programmer and he's here to answer some questions. So the first one I have is when I was, when we were reading this hash, we were talking about how with the Gogan era coming in, that now that people are actually able to uh, create dApps on the Cardano network. First of all, have you done anything with the Cardano network and how easy is it to actually build a dApp on Cardano as opposed to whatever else you might've done in the past? Yeah, sure. I think that from a perspective of, I guess, experience building things, I think the most experience anyone would have at this juncture is working on sort of a test nets or playgrounds, right? Because the major updates are going to are going to come to the Cardano mainnet, um, maybe people might know it by the name Gogan, will bring eventually the ability to build smart contracts on mainnet, which then subsequently enables decentralized applications at large. So, you know, what I've done to date is I've tinkered with the two language playgrounds. So you have on one side, you have Plutus, which is the really, you know, formally verified functional programming language based on Haskell. And then you have Marlowe, which is basically an abstraction of Plutus. Marlowe is intended for, um, you know, for, for people that might not be programmer programmers, right? It gives you a graphical user interface yeah. to drag and drop logical components. Hmm. If you can build a workflow and you understand business process flows, you can make then a functional Plutus smart contract that's deployable to mainnet. Uh, and that's using Marlowe, which is, you know, more specifically a domain specific language. Gotcha. So, so I've worked on both. Perfect. So Hash, could you see Marlowe being used for like somebody like, like any kind of financial industry where they're like, you know, we want to build some kind of like decentralized finance. We want to cut out the middleman and we want to make this flow. We have no uh, coding ability. Could they just go in there and go just drop, just drop uh, cut and paste off they go? Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly the target. And mm. I would see, you know, business process managers, um, some, you know, I guess people who manage financial transactions, and even enterprises that want to enter into contractual agreements with, for which payment is, is processed between the two, um, they can do that using literally a drag and drop interface. And I can send you a link and you can click and you can go to the playground. You can see it in action and actually build out something on Marlowe now in, the, in a testnet environment, uh, which is really cool. Cool. Send it to me and then I'll put it in the description so people can play around with that. That's pretty awesome. Great. And, yeah. And so that would make a lot of sense because I, I know with... Um, with the different heads of the organizations for for IOHK and and IGO and whatever else, it seems like they're really focusing on the Fortune 500 companies, like the big enterprise yeah. type of levels. So I can kind of now I can put the pieces together about why they want to do it like that because not everybody has developers and they kind of make it like that. Got you. So yep. talk to me real quick about the fees because. I mean, to transfer everything on Ethereum is is crazy, ridiculous right now. Even NFTs and things like that. How can yeah. this drop the fees to where these Fortune 500 companies can be like, you know what, we don't know what's going on over there, but we like what we see here. Let's go this route. Yeah. And so I talked about this recently on one of my videos where there are a lot of people now calling for no fees, right? Let's just eliminate fees from blockchains. It's a barrier to entry. I vehemently disagree with that idea because yeah. fees are very important in terms of the security model for most decentralized networks to be what they are. Um, and it, first and foremost, it prevents people from, you know, malicious actors from just sending thousands and thousands or millions of empty transactions to the network to DDoS it, right? To denial of service attack it. Right. So when we move past the no fee idea, uh, really the biggest thing that drives fees in most of these types of networks is laws of supply and demand. There's a limited amount of block space. There's a limited amount of processing power and storage space. So those are the big three. Um, and the miners or the block makers, they have to process smart contract transactions and then they have to store the data if there's state changing information, et cetera. That's the main driver for, for fees. And Ethereum, the reason why the fees are so high is because of supply and demand. There's just not enough space in blocks and enough room in blocks to process enough transactions. So that's where we're at now. And you have, did you have a, something to add? Sorry. No, 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 it wasn't about that. It was about, so, so talk to us about real quick about block space, Ethereum versus Cardano, because, mm -hmm. you know, Ethereum was made, was, was created what, 2014, 15? 15, yeah. 
Yeah, and then and then from there, so you know we we talk about um, the second generation blockchain. Now we're looking at Cardano with the third generation. So how does that blockchain size different differentiate? So now we can have those fees not so much because, like you said, there is supply and demand. We have more of a supply over here. Yeah, I think it's just architecture, architectural decisions that were made in the development of Cardano, right? Understanding that when you know when Cardano really, really kicked off, and let's say you know ages ago, right? It's been a long time since Cardano started building. They were taking lessons learned from Ethereum back then and have continued to do so. And so you have, you know, architectural decisions like the modified UTXO model that they use, plus the, uh, you know, the proof of stake, the Ouroboros protocol for consensus that's been developed, you know, voraciously over the last several years. And so those are some of the things that help with scalability, right? You can process transactions faster. You don't just have one parameter to pull on, which is just block size. So that it's part of part of the mix is how fast transactions can be validated securely. Gotcha. Okay. So last, so first of all, hash. Thanks. I appreciate it. You coming on. So lastly, I'm going to ask you like just, just a, a bigger, bigger type of question. Where do you see Cardano and Ethereum at the end of this bull run, which no, let's we'll say the end of this year, 2021, as far as market cap, where do you see it in the next five years? Interesting. I think if you look at if you look at Cardano and what they have planned, right, the the master plan, quote unquote, starts to come together this year with Gogan and then subsequently um, Basho and Voltaire, some of the governance stuff that's coming. I have a feeling likely what that will mean is that Cardano's market cap will at least double this year, in my mind, at least, if not more. I think in the five year time span, a lot of people are looking at at Cardano to start challenging the market cap that you see Ethereum has, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think sometimes people talk about Cardano taking the market cap that Bitcoin has, but they're so different. I, I don't think you can compare the two. You're more likely to be pulling from the money that's already in something like Ethereum. Um, but that being said, all of this is dependent on new money coming into the space. So there, there's that one caveat. I don't think it's going to be a situation where Cardano just takes all of Ethereum's market share because there are also other projects that are involved in this fight and it's not a zero sum game. A lot of a lot of these projects will be successful in their own niche and Ethereum is really going to be hedged on ETH 2.0. It could very well hold on to a large proportion of the market cap it already has, but maybe just add new money more slowly because there's competition. I, I have a feeling that's really what's going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with that. I think there's, there's room enough for two, but uh, again, we will see. So you heard it here first. Hoshoshi said uh, $10 uh, to Cardano at the end of this year. Great. Thanks. Ash. One can only pray. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate it. Let's jump back.